talk today about P&IDs and where they fall within the program orientation. Process safety information is the element that sets out the requirements for P&IDs. Piping and instrumentation diagrams are not the only element or the only component of process safety information that must be dealt with to have a very effective program and plan. We're looking at other things such as block flow diagrams, labeling and tagging of valves and piping. We're looking at chemical location plot plans so that when fire departments show up to respond to a release, they know the hazardous areas of the facility. We like to see a, a general focus of one area. We can't do that with ammonia piping, but of course that can be done with the rest of the chemicals that they store to use on, on basis of frequencies. Um, Evacuation plot plans for the safety of the workers and visitors when they're on a site so they know how to get out safely, where to go, how to be accounted for. Receptor locations, if we have sensitive public receptors, I understand in, in most jurisdictions this would be handled by the local emergency planning commission or the fire department. However, we expect a facility to know if they have sensitive public receptors nearby, daycare centers, retirement homes, hospitals, uh, long-term long health care, things of that nature. They should have a list of those people so that should we have a catastrophic event, someone can quickly get that information and contact those people and outreach to them. We also need to have an overview of the system along with the technical operating specifications. Overview of the system is just going to be we're taking ammonia at this pressure and this temperature and we're using it to perform this function in this location, whether it be cold storage, chilling water, freezing ice cream, what have you. The more detailed explanation is going to talk about the different components, the technical operating specification, getting very specific as to temperature and pressure within the system at the various locations. Those are just some of the necessary tools that we need so that we can mitigate and handle uh, incidental release or should we have a true emergency response and be in a position to have to pull all of this together and use it effectively. What about the PHA, training and mechanical integrity? Those three elements of CALARP or PSM or RMP are also affected by all of those items listed above. We'll get into a little more detail on the next slide. Again, we want to caution you that just having a good PNID or having a PNID that's not updated is not enough alone to be able to mitigate and handle. We have to have all of these other components as well under process safety information. So what does Title 19 require for process safety information? This is actually from the code, um, Section 2760, Process Safety Information. It basically says before we conduct a PHA, Process Hazard Analysis, we have to have the updated piping and instrumentation diagrams. That is one of the first steps. We have to have the toxicity information. We need to know the reactivity, the hazards, what are the permissible exposure limits. There's a whole group of, of corrosivity data. All of these things have to be taken into consideration to have a good and effective process hazard analysis. If we don't know all of the information, we will not be able to effectively address all of the hazards. Um, in, in this section, we really talk about what we're going to talk about today in item A, a block flow diagram, a um, maximum in intended inventory, and the safe upper and, and lower limits. Those are all things that may be included on a very, very uh, comprehensive piping and instrumentation diagram. You might find someone who does PNID so thoroughly that at every component, they're giving you the limits, upper and lower, for each item. They're giving you a, bl a block flow diagram, which basically gives you, again, that same information, but in a more simple format. Then, next slide. I'm trying. Oh. Okay, then item D, information pertaining to the equipment in the process, the specific information. It's the materials of construction and the piping and instrumentation diagrams. Now, if we step back to item two, where it says, if the original technical information is not available, it may be developed in conjunction with the PHA if, it, if there is enough detail to support the analysis. I'll give you an example. If you have a facility that was born in 1947, 
has high pressure receivers, low pressure receivers. Do you think that that facility is likely to have the national board printouts, the U1 forms, the certified drawings provided by the manufacturer? In 90% of the cases, no. So can, can we develop that through PHA? Yes, we have certified refrigeration engineers out there that know what to look at, what to look for, who are the common manufacturers of components specific to refrigeration. Apollo, do they normally manufacture refrigeration valves that are used in systems? No, they do not. Are they sometimes used? Yes. However, Henry, Hubble, Hansen, refrigerating specialties, those four manufacturers specialize along with others, Rego, um, I don't want to leave anybody out, but, but those of us that do ammonia refrigeration can recognize whether we are looking at components manufactured by refrigeration manufacturers. Now, only a professional engineer with a specialty in, in engineering can sign off. They can walk through a facility, they can inspect all the piping, they know that the piping, if it's a normal temperature, must be A53B ERW. Smaller piping is going to be A106. Low temperature piping is going to be A304? Yeah, A303, A304. I haven't been on the building side of it for a while. But those are things that that refrigeration engineer knows up here. They can go through and certify for an entire plant that all of it was built to code and the materials of construction are established for ammonia refrigeration processes. And yeah. this would apply for any such process that's specific. Go ahead, Mike. In addition to that, a lot of times you'll see this information on the first sheet of a P&ID packet. Uh, it's excellent information. To have all that information together for the operator is very helpful. It uh, helps him operate the system properly. When he goes to choose materials for replacement, he chooses the proper materials. And you will often see that on either the first or second sheet. Sometimes the first sheet may be the simple sheet, the key, but that information should be there. Now, Oh, you want to back up? Go ahead. Now, when it comes to other supporting documentation, if you still have a national board number on a nameplate or you have documented and carried that documentation through the life of the system, you can contact the national board and the end user for a small fee per report can get that documentation. They contact the national board, they give them the national board number. For those of you who may not be familiar with the National Board, it's like the Department of Social Security for high-pressure vessels or low-pressure vessels, vessels that require an ASME stamp. They have a website online. You can submit your query with your National Board number, and they can tell you whether they do or do not have documentation on that vessel. A lot of times companies will hold back and say, gee, you know, we're not willing to spend the $15 per vessel. Well. If you have to have a company come out and certify that vessel, it's going to cost a lot more than $15. So it's a good way to influence them to get their documentation. I can tell you that in 1990, when I started in this industry, we were not as a contractor providing that documentation to the end user because it was not at that point required on a regular basis. Some companies asked for it, some companies didn't. We kept packets so that in the future we could photocopy that information and provide it to them. But nine times out of ten, we were working with the chief engineer, we handed him the book, he tossed it in the garbage can. I don't need any more paper, thank you very much. Got enough to do. Okay. Why? Well, P&IDs, if they're accurate and they're kept up to date, they, they are a very, very important part of keeping the process safe and mechanically sound. And the way they do that is they provide a means for training. A lot of technicians and operators may never get a chance to look at the P&ID and compare it to what they see in front of them. It's an important method of training high pressure, low pressure, vapor, liquid, where are we at in the system, what's happening in the system. We can analyze with that information. We can look at the whole system without walking a plant that takes up six city blocks and losing track from point A to point T. So you can have it all in one location together so that you can use that information to analyze your system. What are the hazards? What kind of valves do we have here doing what and why? Why is it a hazard? When is it not a hazard? We also can use this to maintain the system. 
Yes, um, if an operator is going to go into the system, we call that system entry. Every time they do that, there's a chance of exposure. And we try to, to limit that, the amount of time that they do that, but it has to be done on a regular basis. In that, they have to know what's upstream, what's downstream, which valve to close first, which automatic valves to put in the manual position so that we do not trap ammonia and have a situation like we just had in Houston at the uh, Goodyear plant just uh, two, three months ago? Uh, it was, in fe it was uh, June 12, 2008. Uh, what happened there was uh, a mechanic isolated a heat exchanger improperly without turning the proper valves, opening the proper automatic valves, and trapped refrigerant, liquid refrigerant, between those two valves and the heat exchanger. If you know refrigeration and you heat it up, what happens to that liquid refrigerant? It expands up to a thousand times. Where are we going to find the space between the, those two valves to store that vapor? We don't. The heat exchanger exploded, and a lady was uh, buried for seven hours under rubbish before they actually found her. No head count sheets, no PNIDs, and we'll hear more about that. In fact, the Chemical Safety Board is investigating that at this time. We also have emergencies, and when we have emergencies, this information can be critical in how we decide what we're going to do. In the case of an emergency, we need to protect and respond in any situation, no matter how minor the release. We need to protect the employees, the community surrounding, the guy that's living in the trailer two blocks away that was evacuated in uh, Daly, uh, Daly, Florida in 2001. Emphysema, he was evacuated into an ammonia cloud and died. And so a company needs to be able to get a hold of the situation quickly. We need to know are, how are we going to mitigate? Are we going to hit the button and shut it down? Or are we going to let the system run because that's a better choice? In many cases, depending upon where the leak is in the system, it's better to keep pumping so the ammonia goes back to the high pressure receiver and you're not allowing it to backflow into the hole. And if you shut your compressors down, you're no longer bringing that ammonia vapor back to the compressors and into the high pressure receiver. So decisions have to be made based on flow and things of that nature. Managing it. We have pressure in our systems and we have the capability of managing that pressure to reduce the amount of what is released in a release scenario. We have to manage the flow. Can we close a valve from somewhere outside of the danger zone and stop the flow going to that hole in that pipe, in that condenser, in that evaporator to stop the leak. Can we transfer that ammonia? Have you guys are familiar with firemen's dump boxes and crossover valves? You probably heard about it, maybe some of you yesterday in the talk about the new fire code and crossover valves. The purpose of that system is to be able to move that ammonia into another location where it's not going to go to the hole, to where the release is. How many of you have seen a fireman's control box? How many of you understand why it's there and what its function is? Okay, very good. It's been the code, then it went away, then it came back, it was required, it wasn't required, it's not required again under the International Mechanical Code and the 2007 code. Uh, however, we do now have the automatic crossover boxes so that if we have an excessive pressure on the high side, it is now required that we automatically open a control valve and transfer that excessive pressure to the low side. But there are also manual controls to do that too within that box. That is an excellent place for a sectional PNID because if a fireman goes to that box and tries to operate it, he's going to see all these valves that have valve tags on them possibly, but he's not going to know which one to turn to cross over properly, and he may end up sending that ammonia then to atmosphere or to the diffusion tank. So a sectional PNID is critical in a location like that where you have a critical control. Diffusion. How many of you are familiar with the fact that we use diffusion tanks here in California? We have a place to go with all of our ammonia that is a safe place so we don't harm the community, so that we don't harm workers, etc. How do you decide whether it's best to diffuse? What if that diffusion tank is, you're going to have to run all of the ammonia through that pipe to get to the diffusion? Maybe not the best choice. So those are some of the decisions that have to be made. We believe that the PNIDs are most critical in understanding, first, how to isolate a zone. We consider every box in a place a zone. This room is a zone. 
We can close the doors and we can keep ammonia inside this zone. Then we can determine that there is an air conditioner right on the outside feeding a vent. That's where the leak is and we can isolate that component. But having outdated PNIDs or incomplete PNIDs or PNIDs that no one's looked at since the, the, the plant was engineered is of no use to anyone. And last but not least is process heat. If we have a process that's going, going on and that process is generating heat, there is the potential for continuing the release because of the heat generated by the process. So while everyone's running around worrying about the ammonia leak in the ammonia system, the process is continuing to run. So we can't forget that the process generates the heat that the ammonia abs absorbs, requiring it to flash off, 800 to 1,000 times expansion inside a component, so we want to also have them consider the process side. With emergency response, it's, it's very important that the PNIDs are easy to read, color coding, symbols are standard, uh, you show flow direction, uh, and then you group that with the plot plans, the locations of the equipment, and you have a very effective tool for emergency responders. How many of the plants that you go to actually have a full response team that understands their ammonia refrigeration system? If I was going to say a percentage, probably about 10 to 20 percent. And a lot of the facilities uh, rely on outside responders, so a P&ID is critical. In fact, we recommend that the company have a little bag in their response equipment or somewhere that they can get to in the event of an evacuation. In that bag would be the plot plans, headcount sheets, call lists, and of course P&IDs. And so the reason for that is so if we're not capable as an end user of taking care of our problem, and as we can rely on outside parties, we have that choice, that those outside parties have to have the proper information to mitigate effectively, safely, and efficiently. A good example was the Shamrock Foods incident down in Phoenix, Arizona here um, about a year ago, 2007 I think it was. They sent the fire department in four times to turn two valves. Four times they turned the wrong valves because the PNIDs were not updated and the valves were not tagged nor were the pipes labeled. So all these work together. It's not just the PNID alone, but the PNID is very important. In the Shamrock incident, the information that was given to the fire department is you're going to close these two valves connected to a, a white tank and a green tank. There were at least four white tanks and four green tanks in that engine room, making it very difficult. Um, La Habra, California, how many of you were familiar with the CSI incident many years ago? It was used as an example for fire department training for years and years. There were four responding agencies because the, I'm not familiar with the exact crossover, but in La Habra you have adjoining La Habra, who's from the Los Angeles region in here? Can tell me what other, Santa Fe Springs I believe? maybe Anaheim and City of Industry, I'm not sure, but there were four fire departments that responded to a leak in an engine room. A leak in the engine room is one of the most potentially catastrophic because in the engine room, you generally have a fairly small space. You can quickly achieve a concentration of 15 to 25 percent. However, engine rooms have a lot of oil in them. That will bring the explosion level um, the potential for explosion down to a much lower percentage, anywhere from what, Michael, 8 to 12? Usually about 7 to 7.5% 7 with the refrigeration oil coming out with it. So the fire department went in. They replaced what's called a steady mount on a compressor. It's a little, looks like a little pigtail. The purpose of it is to protect the gauge from vibration on the compressor. And they went in. They changed out the valve. The system was down. They came out. Before anyone went in and tested they brought the system back online we knocked down four fire department personnel and two EMTs and so the confusion you are expecting fire department personnel to know and understand an ammonia refrigeration system and without accurate PNIDs valve tagging and labeling making sure the information that the people we expect to protect us is there for them to be able to do their job effectively is critical and that's what piping and instrumentation diagrams is all about. If you can uh, use a new tool or if you can request your engineers to uh, end users to use a new tool, digital photos along with the PNIDs are excellent. 
I, I can show you, and I will be showing you some P&IDs, what's good, what's bad, we'll be there in a couple of minutes. But those pictures, the fireman understands, or the responder understands. If they are not plant personnel, it's an excellent tool. Because they're going to see exactly what's going to be in front of them when they're standing in front of that compressor. And that is an extremely valuable tool. We found OSHA really likes it for the, for the workers. We have language barriers. We have standard operating procedures. When they use this methodology, it makes it very, very simple. You take the person right to the location. They're looking at exactly what they've got in a di digital photograph, arrows, things to, to bring out what, what's really there. So what are they for? Well, I was an owner, and I was an operator. And I don't really care about your regulations. All I got to do is keep it cold, make it work, and keep my job. I don't have time for the paperwork. I haven't updated my P&IDs for 30 years because the plants changed 15 times. In fact, I don't even know how many valves I have in a place. That is the typical answer from an end user. We have to educate them. I can tell you that 80% of the P&IDs that are out there are not as built. And there's some things that you should look for to make sure that they have been updated. I know how it works. I know where it comes from. I know where it flows to. I know how to zone, I zone isolate every piece of equipment. I know the state and pressure. I turn two or three valves upstream first and manually open the proper automatic bleed valves. I close the downstream valve. And in before that, I doggone make sure I boil off the remaining liquid. Uh, so why do I need them? Why do I need to deal with the additional paperwork? I know where every valve is. I know what every valve and control does. Honest. We took a picture of one of my plants. Hang on before you show the ah. picture of your plant. Now, he's 58 years old and he's retiring next year. And all of this information, it's right up here. So why do we need them? And let's look at one of your drawings. So what do we do here? Well, they're marked. What's you know what the their emergency, you know what their emergency response plan marked. is? Run. Okay. Uh, believe it or not, this is an operating steam plant in California. Okay, it's not ammonia, but it gives you an example of how confusing something could be. And the P&IDs clarify that along with the pipe labels and the valve tags. Without, the, without those three together, you don't have what you need. It's not, you need all the tools. Uh, I have an example here, and Corinne will go through this. Uh, this is well, basically... Wait, 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 wait. Uh, uh, Who uh, in the room knows what LTRS ah. stands for? That, no engineers. LTRS. Oh, good. I don't have to give away my gift from the Coupa conference. This, this is a methodology for labeling pipe. And it's been developed and it's been worked through by the labeling manufacturers. IIAR has come up with a standard. This is a standard labeling practice in the industry. This right here is just telling us that this is a low temperature recirculated suction line. And we have about maybe 15 to 20 common line abbreviations that give us information. But even if you don't know what the LTRS is, well, we know it's a hazardous chemical because it's black on yellow. We know that that hazardous chemical is ammonia. We know the direction that it's going in the line. We know the state, it's liquid, and it's vapor. So we have both liquid and vapor in this line but it's at low pressure. And so that's the purpose. Now, a lot of facilities will look at this when you tell them, you need to label your whole system. And they'll look at this and they'll go and they'll contact the companies that customize these labels. And if you're looking at a 10 inch line, the label that you're gonna buy is $19. So you can have a large plant that's looking at $20,000 to label their piping in this methodology. Is that necessary? No. They can buy yellow and black labels that say ammonia. They can buy wraparound tape, that's the arrows, wraparound tape, that's low pressure, wraparound tape for the vapor tag, and the liquid tag. They can also make them in-house by a machine, so it's much more cost effective for them. Basically, you want to be able to, from the ground, look up at their piping system and be able to tell where the product is going in each line, the direction, what's in it, what state it's in to make decisions. Is it high pressure, low pressure, vapor, or liquid? We have some standards, recommendations. IIAR has a recommendation for piping markers. They talk about, they, their recommendation is that it have five sections. The, the code does not require that abbreviation. 
the LTRS or the CD or the HPL, high pressure liquid. All the, right all the other sections are required. Uh, in fact, most of the states now have uh, requirements for the size of the pipe uh, label, the size of the letter. Valve tags, your code in California, uh, puts out the sizes so that you can read them from a distance. Isn't it um, ASME 13.1 bulletin that's, uh, that gives the outline for every 30 feet, after every turn, it, before and after a wall, and there are some very specific guidelines, but the LTRS, the abbreviation for what the line is to the refrigeration cycle, is not mandatory. Um, marker body being the yellow and black, physical state, pressure level, abbreviation section, directional arrow. Um, here's a neat one that comes right out of the California UMC. It says, Standard number 12, oh, a valve chart shall be mounted under glass at an approved location near the principal entrance to a refrigeration machinery room. How many of you have seen that? Nice big PNID mounted on the wall to support training, to support fire department, to support the plant in making decisions. It's part of the code. In addition, if the valve tags are only have a number, then you have to have a valve list under glass too that says what that valve is for, what it does, and what is its normal state, so that the operator can make correct decisions. If you're going to understand PNIDs, you have to understand the basic refrigeration system. When you get out into the plant, you should know what those components look like. Uh, one of the common things that we find is, the, of course, the PNIDs have been not, not been updated. A simple thing is to look at the types of equipment and then the quantities. If you know that you're going to be visiting a, a facility and one of the things you're going to be doing is taking a tour, and if you're concerned about your your company being in compliance with process safety information. I recommend that when you write them the letter establishing the date that you will be visiting with your people, request a copy of their PNIDs be delivered to you within a week of your letter. Take the three weeks in between as you prepare for this site visit and do some very simple things. We have four to five major component, components in ammonia refrigeration. You do not have to be an engineer to be able to tell if their PNIDs are updated. When you read that PNID, and Michael's going to show you examples, we have compressors, we have condensers, we have evaporators, and we have pressure vessels. Pumps. We have pumps. My recommendation is that you make a list of the major components. Compressors. Count how many compressors are on the drawing. Look for statements like, for future use. You might see one through five in the engine room drawing, and you might see a place where they're, they're planning to expand and put in number six, and it will say for future use. Count those major components from their drawings and make a list that you can use as you walk through the plant. And as you're walking through with your inspection sheet, be in the engine room. One, two, three, four, five, six. Write it down, six. Well, there were only five on the drawing. They did say for future use, but they've installed that sixth compressor, haven't they? And they haven't updated their drawings. As built is something you want to look for on drawings as well. When I worked for a contractor starting in 1990, and I started learning the process of building ammonia refrigeration systems, the way the flow goes is I worked for a contractor that had an in-house engineer but not all contractors do. And some companies will like one contractor, but they'll like a different engineer. They may not want to use the engineer that works for that contractor because they've had success with other engineers. So I call my engineer and I say, I want to be able to do a 35 degree temperature on a 2,000 square foot warehouse and I'm going to be cooling uh, 25 million pallets of oranges. And the engineer does all the work, talks to you back and forth, gets details, how many rooms will you have, et cetera, et cetera. They design the system, and they write the PNID. They give me that PNID and that set of specs for that particular design and that particular system. And then I farm it out. I give it out to three or four different contractors that are unique to ammonia refrigeration 
You want to look for that. You want to know that the contractors that are involved in dealing with your ammonia sites are specifically refrigeration contractors. That means they have years and years and years of experience and they're not just South Valley plumbing. You know, they understand ammonia refrigeration processes and that's what they specialize in. Or be able to support that they have the knowledge to handle refrigeration. So I farm out my quote, my four contractors bid on my project, I pick my contractor, I turn everything over to my contractor, my contractor comes to me as they're starting to build things and they say, we can't do this now. There's a wall there. And we're not going to be able to have this on this side and that on that side of the wall. So we have to change it. Does the, does the engineer update the drawing when it's finished at no charge? No, they do not. At $250 an hour, they will update that drawing for you. So a lot of companies will forego that. Um, redlined, if a company starts identifying weaknesses or errors, many times they'll use a red line pencil or pen and they'll mark where there are in inaccuracies on a drawing. And we find that to be acceptable. We do not feel that a company should, every time they make a minor change to their system, move a valve, this or that, have to send it back to the engineer, pay lots of bucks to get an updated drawing for one valve change or two valve changes. But we do feel that it's reasonable if they know we're going to be making changes for three to five years. When we're finished, we're going to have all of these updated. As long as they're maintaining the working set of drawings that is the reference for everyone, then that's acceptable. It needs to be kept up to date with the changes that are made. A good way to check on that is look at their management of change in the, in the CalR program. <clears throat> Excuse me. If they've had a management of change, if it was major enough, they've changed some components. They've changed some piping. Look at the data on the management of change. Go to the drawing and make sure the revision on that drawing has, within a reasonable time frame, the same date. Usually, the work is done on a preliminary construction drawing, and the update, uh, updated P&IDs will follow a couple months later, maybe up to six months later. But look for that revision. All right, basic re uh, refrigeration systems. Some of the components you should be aware of, and I'll use my pointer here, are the vessels and know what they are. The drawings will typically have the dimensions of the vessel on, the normal operating parameters, and typically they'll have the manufacturer and national board number. Ah, this is where the owner can go back and find that board number many times so that they can get that birth certificate on that vessel. In addition, you'll run into things such as evaporators, which you'll see hanging from ceilings. Those are air units where we absorb the ammonia into the system. And you'll see other things like chillers, shelling tubes, things like that. Outside, you will see the condenser where we reject the heat from the system. And the other major component that you want to look for is, of course, the compressors. Now, this is very minimal. And doing it graphically like this, you can somewhat see what the equipment looks like. But a lot of P&IDs don't show you that. A lot of training documents does not also. The best thing that you can do on a P&ID is color code it so that you can follow the lines and that you know what the pressures are, whether it is the high side of the system or the low side of the system. And they can be very simple or they can be very de detailed. It depends on the system and the process involved. Uh, better yet, uh, you can have another set of training documentation where you actually have photos of the equipment along with the P&IDs for training and for helping their emergency responders. Uh, this is one that I made up for a Yuma Safety Day that I gave a talk and I, I just kept it very simple. Uh, the basic refrigeration system is a simple mechanical system that can move heat from some area where you don't want it and take that to an area where you can get rid of it <coughs> Excuse me, or use it for some process. And what we simply did was we wanted to show flow so we first show the compressor and we show the high pressure gas coming out of the compressor going to the condenser. And I think most of you, if you've seen refrigeration systems, you've seen equipment like this. This happens to be an evaporative condenser, which is very common. And as you look at the system, and as you put these pictures in your mind, know what to look at so when you look at the quantities and you follow the lines, where it's coming from, where it's going to, you can make a relatively educated uh, uh, assessment of the quality of the P&IDs. From there, the condenser usually drains into a vessel, which is not shown here, which is your high-pressure receiver. Ah, one thing that you'd like to see on your P&IDs is that the major valves not only labeled, but identified in a very effective manner, such as what we call the king valve. Now, this can be good, this can be bad. Sometimes the fire departments think that once they close that king valve, we're all safe, we don't have to worry about anything. 
there are other valves that send ammonia out to the process that are major. The king valve is one, which is liquid, and the other one we seem to forget is the hot gas valve, the main hot gas valve. We've had a number of incidents where we've isolated a system using the king valve, and the system then goes into defrost. We take hot gas, which is coming out of the top of that compressor under high pressure, and we send that out to that same location. We have had people responding next to a unit like that. They didn't realize it. They didn't follow the PNIDs. They didn't look at full isolation of that component. They missed that line, and we've got a direct hit, and we've had people exposed because of that. Now, sometimes you'll, you'll see a sign on, in and around the um, high-pressure receiver called queen valve. Sometimes people use that as the designation for the main hot gas line out of the high-pressure receiver. And sometimes they use that for the drain coming from the condenser to the high-pressure receiver. Right. So it can be confusing. Okay. So ask them and make sure that they know. So what is this? What does this mean to you in your system? Typically then from the high-pressure receiver, we'll then go out to the process, the chillers, the evaporators, where we absorb the heat into the system. If nothing, they should know how to zone, zone isolate those components. Those are where the exposure is going to be. That's where the production worker is going to be. That's where the product's going to be. In the engine room, we have a lot of control. Out of the engine room, we don't. We have ventilation in the engine room. We usually have ammonia detection. We have diffusion and other safeties that work along with that equipment. Out in the rooms, we don't have that option typically. From the evaporators, we pick up the heat, and that's where we expand, and it's pushed into the compressor and the whole cycle starts over again. I know it's not a refrigeration class, but you need to know the basic flow of refrigerant, and you can do that by looking at the PNIDs. They'll have directional flow on them, and hopefully the pipes are labeled also as you go to the plant. The systems can get much more complicated. That was a very simple system. Uh, another graphically showing, showing you some of the components. I am going to move on to another one here, uh, and show you some of those components again, so you can see what they look like. Down in the bottom right hand corner we have a screw compressor. Uh, that can be a screw, it can be a reciprocating compressor, which looks like a car motor. There, uh, it then discharges to the condenser, which is typically outside, up on a tower, out on the ground. And that's where we get rid of the heat in the system. From there that drains and changes into a liquid and drains into the high pressure receiver. This is our main liquid supply or storage tank for refrigerant that is then sent out to the system where it's needed. This is where you're going to find the king valve. Every plant should have not only the valve number but a sign that says king valve because that is an industry term. It is a standard used across the country, used in all countries. From there the liquid then goes out to the process. Ah, the first point of zone isolation is that king valve. Now we can move out to the process and we can either take that refrigerant directly out to our chillers or we can go to a vessel that pumps it out to those chillers. Another point of zone isolation, another point of mitigation. The ammonia pumps pump that ammonia out to those process areas typically where the production workers are working and or where you have products stored. If we can get to those switches that turn off those ammonia pumps, we can start to mitigate that release. Instrumentation. And that's why it's important to not only have piping, valves, but also have the controls and the instrumentation on that drawing. That is why it's called a piping and instrumentation drawing. Okay, and then we can get even more advanced into a system. How many of you have uh, plants in your facilities, refrigeration plants that do blast freezing, meat or ice cream facilities, chicken? Uh, they will have a two-stage system. Now we have to deal with three pressures and an additional uh, set of components. On a two-stage system, we discharge from one compressor into another in series, and we have to cool those gases before the, we do that. So we have to add what's called an intercooler. This is going to be another large vessel within a system, and it's another component that you should look at when you look at the PNIDs. When you go to the plant, it's also required that each one of these components has an identification on them specific to it not the same as 15 other pieces of equipment in the same system. Compressors, C1, C2, C3. Vessels, maybe V1, V2, V3, or they may have a name, but you have to be, you have to have a specific identification on those, and it should match the PNID. You're going to find many times they don't. Uh, either they won't have the identification, or the identification that is on the PNID is not the same that's on the component. 
And the most common system out it that you'll see out there in your areas is the pumped overfeed system. And again, simple refrigeration system. Again, we're using pumps to pump the liquid to the uh, evaporators, out to the rooms, etc. And we need to know where that refrigerant is coming from. How do we know that? We go to the PNIDs. Okay. If they don't train on the PD, PNIDs, if they don't look at the process overview, if they don't understand the operating parameters of the system, they're of no value to them whatsoever. I think you'll find that most of the PNIDs in our plants are still nice and clean. There's no grease on them, they don't look dirty, and they're stored somewhere, except they may have dust on them. Look for that. You can tell where they've actually used them or not, just like all the other plants that we have. In that, what we're finding is as we expand, as we change the plant, it is not a priority and we become complacent. We don't update the PNIDs. We don't use them to update the SOPs and we don't train on them. We don't use them to have a plan in an emergency and when the emergency happens we don't have the information to execute properly. If we don't execute properly we're going to see chemical burns like this ranging from a small splash with the proper flush to a second degree burn to improperly sealing in an ammonia burn with petroleum products. So it is critical for emergency response. Uh, I have a picture here of a gentleman that we've worked with for years. This gentleman is named Scott, uh, refrigeration mechanic for 10 to 15 years, entered a system, thought he had it completely isolated, but there was ammonia in the areas that he thought he had isolated. He should have taken more time. An example of being complacent, Scott now teaches a little bit and he's made a video for us of what actually happened. PNIDs are a very important tool. All right, so what is a PNID? Uh, PNIDs, PNIDs show all the piping, including the physical sequence of branches, reducers, valves, equipment, instrumentation, and control interlocks. Uh, where we're lacking in a lot of our PNIDs are the interlocks, the safety controls. Uh, what a float does, uh, what a solenoid does, the actual controls of the system, because we have both manual and automatic controls in refrigeration. The PNID is used for training, operating the process, and emergency response. At minimum, the PNID should include, now this is based on how advanced the system is or how simple it is, uh, the capabilities of the facility, but the things that they should consider and have on the PNID are instrumentation and designations of that instrumentation, mechanical equipment with names specific to it and numbers, all the major valves and their identifications, what they do and their normal state. We want to know if they're normally open, if they're normally closed, or if they're metered. If a person goes and works on a piece of equipment and forgets the position of that valve, the normal position, they now have a PNID to go to. Now that may be described in the valve list, and I'll be showing you some of those where it gives you that information, or for a normally closed valve, you will typically see that the valve itself is colored in. It's called hatched. If you do any AutoCAD, we just fill it in. It shows that it's normally closed. And a normally open valve will just have the triangles, and that designates that it is open. The internal of that is not colored in. Process piping, sizes and identification. Miscellaneous, we have vents, drains, we have special fittings, sampling lines, and possibly reducers and increasers. Now, the, the reducers and increasers aren't that critical. Typically, we will put the line sizes on. When we change to another line size, we'll then identify that one way or the other and then put that line size on there. Permanent startup and flush lines. Flow direction is critical. Interconnection references, uh, should you go from one drawing to another. Control inputs and outputs, interlocks, how is that system controlled? Enunciation inputs, computer control system inputs, identification of components and subsystems sub delivered by others. We have a lot of equipment in this industry that does not stay at that plant. We might have a stationary portion within that system, but then we have portable equipment that is only interconnected to the main system seasonally. It may be in northern or, or in central California and then go down to Yuma or Phoenix for a season of growing and then come back. So you have to be aware that equipment will be there at times and it will be gone during other times. If you want to see the whole system, go during the growing season. <coughs> uh, excuse me. <coughs> Intended physical sequence of the equipment. This can be done in an overview or summary of the system or by showing the flow on the system in an instrument, instrumentation. You can do that right on the PNID. Okay, so PNIDs, what is good, what is bad, the value, the bottom line, 
They must be accurate, and they have to actually be used during training. Again, alone, they do not afford the best practice to keep the system safe, but they are a very valuable part. So let's take a look at some PNIDs. Now, I wasn't able to do this on PowerPoint or do this in a PDF because the drawings are too large, so I actually have to bring up AutoCAD and the drawings, and we'll start looking at some examples. All right, the first view I have here is a simplified block flow diagram. Uh, it is used for training, uh, for training on SOPs, for training new operators, uh, fire and response. Uh, it is not a PNID, but it is required under the standard and under the regulation. Uh, let me try a different background here. And if you guys want to move up, this is what we were talking about earlier. Um, we can blow up in certain areas and get a better view for you like this, but you can't see the big picture that way. Uh, a lot of times the block flows will just simply be in black and white. Uh, we are pushing for color coding because then we also show the state of the refrigerant. So the operator responder knows whether it's liquid or vapor, whether it's high pressure or low pressure. In that, what we have here is just a simple couple of components. In fact, if you'll see where it says V1 high pressure receiver, you'll see that the top half of that vessel, which is a horizontal vessel, is red, and the bottom half of that vessel is a purple or a magenta. Uh, that color signifies that we have liquid probably in 20 to 30 percent to 50 percent of the vessel and we have vapor on the top. The responder then knows that if the leak's on the bottom, what's coming out? Liquid. If the leak's on the top, it's vapor. And we handle vapor and liquid differently in emergency response when it comes to ammonia refrigeration. It also shows all the major components of the system. Let me just zoom here a little bit. The interconnected piping and the flow and direction. So within just a color code, you have flow, state, pressure, and the general information that you need to study the system. It's called a simplified block pro flow diagram. You're going to find out that most of the plants out there do not have this, and they are supposed to have it under the code. This is a good place to get your counts. Exactly. It's, it's easier to follow than a 48-inch drawing of the entire plant and a magnifying glass. The next thing you want to look for is a decent key, symbol chart, that shows what all the components are and all the abbreviations are. I've got a couple here. I'll just bring a little bit up here and give you a taste for it. And first, what I've got here, I've zoomed in on an area that has the abbreviations for all the, the lines, the, the equipment, what it is. So for instance, if we look in this section right here, FG stands for foul gas. It's a gas line. Glycol return, so we're not dealing with ammonia in these two lines. They are an antifreeze, usually a food grade. Hot gas, high pressure liquid, etc. There are hundreds of acronyms and abbreviations used out there. Again, there is no industry standard. There is a lot of commonalities, so it is critical that the operator have the symbol sheet and the proper designations. Let me just go to the left here, and we'll get into some of the components. I can't tell you, and I've been doing this for a long time, how many different types of control valves there are. They need to be identified on the system so that operator knows, number one, its function, direction of flow, uh, what it actually does, and how to manually open it or manually close it if that's the case. If you look here in the next aisle over, or, or column over, you'll see that I have a couple of different valves brought up here. This valve being uh, the triangles are bordered, the internal part of those triangles are not colored in, that tells me that's a normally open valve. Down below, just a little further down, you'll see a valve that's hatched or colored in. That tells me a normally closed valve. So as an operator or te technician, when I go to work on that system, I know the proper position of that valve. And in addition, under CalARP, there's a new standard that came out, which is system entry. Requirement that's come up. It was an industry standard, and now I've seen it on the Cal OSHA checklist. Uh, I just saw it out of the Fremont office. Uh, uh, who is it? Tom Johnston came down and did some inspections in our area. They are requesting a written program for system entry to enter that system safely, to make sure that the ammonia has been removed and pumped out. Well, if you don't have accurate PNIDs, there's chances that you may miss a branch line or an automatic line and then get exposed. In the system entry, we write down the valve numbers and we tag the valves to the normal positions. 
And when we're done, we remove those valve tags, returning those uh, valves to the normal position. It's a very simple means, one page, very simple means of controlling the system, making sure it's flat, as we call it, pumped out. And then when we go back online, we put the valves in the right position. I'll give you one example. Uh, Iowa, this year, uh, we had a meat processing plant that had a contractor that put a new process in, required a liquid line in a process area. He went into the engine room and opened the liquid line in the engine room without verifying that the other valves were in the proper position. Did not pressure test the system as required, and he blew liquid ammonia all over 15 people. One lady passed away. Uh, we have fatalities on an annual basis in the United States with ammonia. We want to see those stop. Again, no P&IDs, management of change wasn't done, and the process information was updated, and they didn't use system entry or double check. And the contractor <clears throat> was allowed to have free reign over the actions that they took on site. Yep. And that's one thing that we stress critically. End users, facilities need to understand that they are 100% responsible for the actions that a contractor takes on site. So they should be signing off on the entire procedure before the contractor picks up a single tool. There needs to be a plan. All right, this is a very simple P&I, P&ID of a single stage system. You'll see a lot of these out there, or excuse me, a two stage system, where you run into uh, cold rooms that are at minus 20 degrees or lower. Uh, it's a start of a P&ID, but it is not complete. Very commonly on a P&ID, if they're color coded, the first thing you'll see is the piping and maybe a control legend. They'll show the color codes, what the piping is, what it does, high stage suction, high stage discharge, and if you look over to the left, you'll see those three or four letters that are used on that pipe label to identify where that pipe, where that ammonia comes from, or where it goes. That's a process of reading the P&IDs, going through training specific to the system, and also understanding what the acronyms and abbreviations mean. Many times on the PNIDs, if you're wondering what the charge is in the system, it'll be on there. Uh, it's very good information for the responder to know the quantity of hazardous chemicals that he's dealing with. I'll just take a section here and let's see how it shows up. It shows up pretty good. Uh, here we have an air unit. The air unit is called AU1. It tells the model and and make of that unit, excellent information, and it shows the controls to control the flow of ammonia into and out of the unit, critical for zone and component isolation. However, do you see only valve numbers whatsoever? They haven't gotten that far. It's the beginning of a P&ID, but it is color-coded and it gives them a lot of information. You will find a lot of P&IDs out there that do not have valve tag numbers on them. In addition, once they do get the valve tags done, they're in that position now, they should have a valve list. <clears throat> they should list the shutoff valves and what they do. For instance, this company wanted to put the valve numbers in flow. Very good idea. The first valve, they picked the starting point, was SV1. The next valve down the pipe was service valve number two, SV2, and so on and so forth. It says that it is located at EC1. Uh, it is the discharge line shutoff valve. So you simply, back to the drawing. And you should be able to locate a valve that says SV1 on a discharge line. Now, because I know refrigeration, I would know where I'm going to find that. Unfortunately, the drawing isn't complete. Another thing you're going to look for is you're going to want to look for uh, dotted lines around a component or a cloud around the component on the drawing. If you see that, it was probably a construction drawing, and that was a request for a change. And I'll show you an example of that shortly. And we can get into some drawings that can be quite intense. A gentleman was talking to me about the chicken plant. This is a plant that processes products similar to that. And you can see that it can be quite uh, busy, I guess you would saw it. Now, on some of these PNIDs, what we'll do then, because it gets so busy, is we will break them up. What you're seeing here is a drawing of the whole facility. And I'll be zooming in on some of these areas. This drawing uh, we happened to do for a company, uh, it was 48 inches by 6 feet. It's not easy to lay out anywhere, uh, but it's critical to have drawing, one drawing of the whole system uh, on one sheet somehow. The average operator out there can't follow all these areas, all these labels, and go from small drawing to small drawing to small drawing. So we push for one drawing of the complete system. 
Of course, on the drawing, typically the first sheet on the drawing is going to be your legend and your symbol sheet. And you're going to be looking on that main drawing, and it should be on all drawings. Just let me scroll down here. You're going to want to know what that symbol sheet is. Somewhere on that drawing, you are going to have a revision number or a date of when it was last updated. Revision number one, revision number two, revision number three. Right. On the drawings themselves, the P and ID, you should see the two words that we're looking for. What are those? As built. As built. As built. Look for that. It's not required that they put that on there or look for the right revision date uh, and match that up to their last management of change or the construction of a facility or expansion. They uh, might refer to it that way verbally when speaking to you. Oh, well, these are our as built. If you were to say, well, these don't match the drawings that we have at the county, oh, these are as built. And that's what they're talking about. Again, we have the valveless, and these can get quite intense. There can be thousands of valves in a plant. This whole page right here is nothing but shut-off valves, stop valves. The second page that I have here, stop valves. And then we have hand expansion valves. We have drain, solenoid, and check valves. We have relief and gauge valves, and it can go on and on. They need to have it in a format that the operator can easily follow. Now that was the main drawing for the system. Let me uh, go back here and show you one more thing. Uh, and this is very common. You'll see that oh, this, in fact, with a lot of PNIDs, which are what I'm going to show you now, is pretty much becoming industry standard. The drawings get too busy, they get too hard to manage, and we can't get them all on one sheet, or we struggle to get them all on one sheet in a size that the end user can read what's on that sheet and follow the lines. What we'll typically do then, is we will break the drawing up. Get a little closer here. And we will put tags on. Uh, let me try to bring this up on the white screen instead. So on the main drawing, we've got all the lines. And then what we do is we break the drawings down. And our break point will be in between these arrows, or diamonds. And what we have here is we have a, for example, we have a six inch vapor line. It's operating at these conditions. And it's coming from drawing number R5. It is line number 21. And as you can see, the triangle is going into that box. To the right of that, we then have 21 again, with this triangle going into this one. And it says the same thing. And it is going to drawing number R-02. So that the operator can easily go from drawing to drawing. All too often, the drawings won't have this. You'll have 15 drawings, and it'll just say, see evaporator section. Now he's got to go through all these drawings to try and to find out where that is. In emergency response, it's not the position that you want to be in. You want to have to have quick action, decisive action. So we'll break them down into details, and I'll just give you a couple. We'll take a section. These now, very typically, you will find these in the, in the binder. They will break these down to 11 by 17 tabloid, uh, sometimes uh, 8 and a half by 11, which gets very difficult because they'll have tons and tons of drawings, but they will break them down. Take a section of the system. You have your connection points, as shown here, where you have your uh, arrows uh, showing where it's coming from, where it's going to, and you will break the system down. Now, this drawing here has the valve numbers on it, like it should. The operator can then go to that PNID. He can look for that valve tag out in the plant. We can send the fireman out there who doesn't know anything about refrigeration, show him a plot plan, where it's located, and tell him the two valve numbers. If they have the PNID, they have digital photos, or if the valves are tagged, they can easily identify the proper valves and turn the right ones. I can't tell you how many times we have turned the wrong valves. That may be uh, what they'll find down at Houston Goodyear where we just had the heat exchanger blow that the, uh, whoever was working on the system closed the wrong valves and didn't bleed, bleed down properly. And they may not have been identified if it happens a lot. In addition to that, in Houston, they had put plugs in the relief valves. So the relief valves were not able to do their job. So those are things when you're looking at and touring a plant and looking at systems, there are some key things that you're always going to want to be looking for. Plugs missing from orifices oil drain locations where the cap has been removed and not replaced because it takes too long for me to put that cap back on or to put that plug back in. That is, the whole entire system is subject to loss 
should there be some sort of failure in that valve. So just general inspections, plugs and caps, if you see them gone everywhere, you know, there gives you an indication of, of possibly the maintenance habits. It's an extremely hazardous material, so they have to c control the energy. Uh, we've had a ton of incidents where we've had a sanitation hose uh, that somebody dragged across a valve, bumped it open. It may have been a drain point that they drain often, uh, say, oil, and there's no plug or cap in the end of that pipe. Uh, that plug and cap is there for that big leak. Uh, if it's not there, we have had releases uh, where somebody's bumped into it. Uh, there are good P&IDs and there's bad P&IDs. There's P&IDs that are very legible. There's P&IDs that you can't read anything. We have a couple of companies <coughs> excuse me, that like to use yellow on a white piece of paper. In a couple of years, you can't read the P&ID. So the owner or operator has to go back to the engineer and buy another set of drawings. Okay? We, there's a lot of times when they'll lock you in. In addition, if you look down here on the bottom, and I've removed the text so it does, these don't say as built. These drawings actually said as built. You see those clouds there? These are construction drawings. They're design drawings. That's either the end user, the installer, or the engineer saying, is this what you want? Or do we need to change this? You see a cloud like this? It is typically, it's pretty much an industry standard with what we do. They are not as built. So you can go to the section of that system, take the P and ID, have the owner or operator show it to you, and you'll probably find out that the instrumentation, the piping, and the valves are incorrect. All right, I'll, I'll go from the details now, and I will say that the... Um, the P&ID is a good tool. It really is. But there's something else that you should have. You should have an accurate plot plan. Now, I'm not going to blow this up all the way. It can be very detailed like this, or it can just show the, the location of the major con, uh, components. Under your authority, if we have Coopers in here uh, and other regulators, uh, you can request, and it's optional, I believe, at this point in California, a grid map of the facility showing uh, the location of the hazardous chemicals, where they'll put them in, then you have a key A5, ammonia, A6, sulfuric acid, whatever. Uh, when we do an HMBP, we push for that, and I'm seeing more and more that it is a very important tool to a responder. A good example would be, uh, what was the Moss Landing incident? Can you go ahead and just touch on that? Uh, Duke Energy, Moss Landing, several million in fines, um, multiple contractors on site, they were converting, converting from a diesel process to a hydro process, and they had six, six, six million gallon diesel tanks in the very back of the plant. Uh, any of you ever been out to Moss Landing, the Moss Landing power plant, plant up Highway 1 through Monterey going north? They own several miles, about, about a mile and a half deep, and at the very back of their plant was where the diesel tanks were located. They had finished the conversion, everything was great, now it was time to take those steel tanks out. So they had multiple contractors out there, they had torches, um, forklifts, and everything was being run by propane. So they moved about 15 to 20 propane bullets from where they were normally stored back to the dirt road where they were driving up and down and refilling torches, refilling propane tanks, and they did not have an effective fire watch system. They were cutting up the top of a tank that had diesel in it. And the spark got into the tank, caught on fire. North Monterey County Fire Department from Castroville, which is a fairly small division, goes to go on scene. They're using the rear access road because that's the closest way that they can get in. And about the time they started showing up on scene, the bullets started overheating. So here we are with multiple engines pulling on scene and propane bullets flying through the air at the fire trucks. So we're taking out our rescuers by relocating our propane. And a simple phone call to the LEPC yes. and to the North Monterey County Fire Department to tell them for the time of this project, which is going to be X to Z, we are going to move these 15 to 20 bullets back to the back end of the property, have them come out, observe where they are, wasn't done. And so we're putting our rescuers at risk and their lives at risk. There were no fatalities. Um, we had somewhat of an ashen cloud, but there was about a $5 million fine for Duke Energy, which then very shortly sold the plant. 
Yeah, the plot plans along with the PNIDs are very uh, important. If you don't know where the equipment is and you're trying to respond and you don't have the proper people there during the response because the chief engineer that's been there for 30 years is fishing and nobody else knows anything, uh, you, you need to have that information. And mm -hmm. so even though it's an optional or it's optional right now under uh, the HMBPs that we administer out there, I would push for you to uh, ask the, the end users to include those in their program. Uh, it is important information. And if they're going to move the equipment, that they notify you. Uh, we have a lot of portable equipment in California. Do any of you deal with the portable refrigeration where it's there for a while and then it's gone and it's back? Uh, and they have nurse tanks, the little white tanks with ammonia in them. Are they always in the same place? No, they move them around all over the time. Some are empty, some are full. Um, we don't know, but we should know where they're, at least they're located. And then we can assume for worst case that they are full. And critical in the event of a fire because ammonia expands based on heat. A vessel can only hold so much when you start heating it up, heating it up. Nurse tanks don't get a lot of maintenance. Um, there should be a pressure relief valve installed that will protect that vessel from blowing up. But if they're not inspecting their nurse tanks, if they're not monitoring and they just keep moving them around the site and it's adjacent to a building that's on fire, how long is it going to be before that ammonia tank blows and takes off? Yes, Don. Go ahead, Don. When that's connected to a structure, is that considered, is that considered a stationary process? If it is connected to a structure, it's part of a stationary process. And it should any, be a any, any, indi any indi 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 interconnected piping, bottles, tanks is how it's worded? Yes, it becomes part of That's correct. I understand jurisdiction between stationary and non-stationary. Yeah, you're correct. If it's connected to the building and a piece of that equipment is hanging from that building, it's stationary. And a lot of them are tied in. A lot of them don't want to have the increased ammonia quantities on hand, so they'll tie into their house system. And that's pretty, that's pretty common. Right here I've got just a real simple one. You know, on the left side of the drawing we've got the alphabet on the top. It's numerical. So now we have a grid. And then we typically have a sheet, uh, Excel spreadsheet or a document, that lists what chemical is at what location on that grid. In fact, the forms in most of the counties have examples and have the grids on their web websites. Uh, in addition to having the hazardous chemicals located, uh, it affords us a manner to show where the piping is laid out uh, in the equipment. For instance, this is a small ammonia refrigeration system, and it shows the air units within the cooler, and I'm going to blow up some more for you. It shows the major equipment that, Don, is portable but also stationary. It's connected, but seasonally it's moved. So we have a stationary system. When it's there and it's connected, it's stationary. Making it simple, they may just use a simple identifier like this, simply battery acid. Okay, and they show the location of that. They may go into a more of a detail, what is the actual chemical makeup, but it gives you an idea that you're dealing then with sulfuric acid. All the ammonia locations would then be identified, such as those tanks that could explode on you and become bullets. Okay. And almost all our sites have propane too, so the propane tanks would be located also. Nitrogen also. Nitrogen. Yeah, more and more common you're seeing nitrogen used in the cold storage uh, industry. Uh, another example of incomplete drawing, this is a PDF, give me just a second here. If you're going to put information on a PNID, then you should make sure that it is accurate and it's complete. Uh, for instance here, instead of writing a technical operating inspection, this PNID had the information necessary right on the PNID to cover the specification operating parameters of the equipment. Unfortunately, we run into this a lot. It's never been completed. You see design pressure, we don't have it. Operating temperature, we don't have it. Cubic feet, ah, we can now do an ammonia inventory calculation. Uh, operating in H3 capacity, national board number. If they're going to have the blocks on there, they need to have the information filled out. Typically, if you find something like this on a P&ID, they don't have it anywhere else either. And you're required to have that information under Keller. There is not a requirement that all of that information be on the drawing, however. No, there isn't. But it's you a do... part of the overview and technical operating specification. Yep. It is part of the in information that's required under process safety. It is a simple way to teach. Yep. Uh, the more information that's on the drawing, the better get through, we call it, to the operator or technician is. Because going back and forth to drawings to systems can be really confusing. 
And I have another example here of, here of a sectional PNID where it is not an as-built, uh, where they're doing so updates, they're changing, or they have questions that it may be accurate to the engineer. And you'll want to look for these clouds. Uh, and that's all I have for you. Corrine, do you have anything to add? No.